good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. This is the ideal life. Mark Twain. You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome to Writing Roots. I'm Lee Hole. And I'm Lee Esses. We get to our favorite part of this whole series where we've been critiquing each other, tearing each other apart, roasting each other. Now we actually get to be friends and tell each other what we liked. Throughout both of the books, I think you'll agree, there are a lot of moments that really shine, that really are evidence and proof to yourself that your writing can be elevated to the next level right at that every time and then this is how we know that we're growing and we can take pride in our writing and it's always a good reminder to have something while you're editing while you're being edited as that reminder of no really this is good what you did was good yes i have edits but you have some amazing moments in here so Major spoiler alert here. Again, we are going to be going over our books that were released last month. We are going to use direct quotations of our favorite moments from those. So if you are worried about the spoilers, don't listen in. However, if you've already read it, if you don't care about spoilers, these are really good examples of our writing and our capabilities. Toot toot. That's my own horn. So we'll just kind of bounce back and forth. I'll go ahead and start this off with one of my favorite moments. I'm just going to be doing Fog and Flames, the first book of Lee's, just to kind of simplify things. One of the first moments in the book is probably one of my favorites, a very good display of the main character and his personality. Feyana's body was still at the feet of the sorceress when I turned back. Every emotion filled me. Fear? Absolutely. Battling a well-trained sorceress alone was practically suicide. Sadness was also prevalent with the carnage of the school around me. Even happiness was in the mix. I was glad to be on the battlefield despite the fear. Glad she showed no sign of surrender. That alone gave me permission to strike her down where she stood. But anger was the purest and most overwhelming of all, guiding my steps as the raindrops turned to steam around me, no one was allowed to attack the school, my school, and particularly not a clansman. I was the sword of justice. And it's such, oh, it's such a good representation of the main character and who he is at his core. Emotions are a particularly difficult thing for me. So trying to say he's feeling more than one emotion was a bit of a stretch. So I'm really glad it read well, and it's one of your favorites. This next one that I want to point out for you is something that you may or may not be aware of about your own writing, but you are really good at the whole metaphor thing. We've said multiple times throughout the series, your use of nerddom is spot on. But if you don't write this exact series in other types of worlds, other types of stories, use your metaphors. This is an example of that, that I wanted to show somebody around me, but nobody would get it as I was reading it. The last thing I wanted was to talk about my life recently, which included the bald spot on the back of my head and a couple healing scars. My body was a mural of bad decisions and terrible luck. That is a great character voice moment, but the mural of bad decisions. It's like that, that's a trailer moment right there. <laughs> I'm really proud of that line personally. I don't think I'm good at metaphors. They just pop into my head and I'm like, ooh, that would be good. Every time you use one though, it's always exactly what it needs to be in a way that really conveys the feeling and gets the point across. If you ever have a moment in your writing, should I put a metaphor here? Should I not put it in? Okay. Not that you need the word count. Speaking of metaphors, this is an example from your story. Less metaphor. I mean, it is technically a metaphor. But again, this is another really good representation of character and who Ilana is at her core through the use of a story metaphor. 
for context, this character is telling a story about when she was younger talking to her dad. He asked me if I was a potato or an egg. His point was that in troubled times, I had two choices. I could let the water turn me soft inside like a potato or hard inside like an egg. I told him that I was tea. I like tea, yes, but I decided that I was tea because I wouldn't let the water change me. I would change the water by being there when the trouble came. Not a potato or an egg. Tea. So this is early on in the story. It teaches us so much about Ilana and her view of the world and her determination. And just the use of water boiling and what it can do to certain objects, how she turns that common phrase into, I'm tea. I change the water. I affect the world around me. I don't let it affect me. I think the potato or egg thing, I believe it's Russian or somewhere around that area. There's a phrase in the language that I read at one point and I really liked it. And so it ended up traveling in here. Most of my stories have tea as a plot point in some way. So tea kind of becomes a secret nickname for her whenever she's about to make a decision that looks foolish, but she's doing it to further her cause of stopping the bad guys, helping the people, changing the world around her, changing her circumstances in some way. So I needed a, a little code word that they can share to have a little intimacy, and it ended up coming from that story. This small story at the beginning does so much in the end for the purpose of your book, and it's amazing. One of the things in your story that I really liked seeing was seeing Logan grow a little bit. Yeah, she has a lot of growing to do as well, but I feel like Logan is also changed from the beginning to the end. In the first book, she was his mission, so he could invest his work time in her. So when she's no longer his mission and he has to split time between workaholic Logan and girlfriend, that struggle is very obvious. And I liked seeing those moments where she sees him choosing elsewhere. That's where part of this next quote comes from. It was all Logan had to say to convince me that he understood how I felt. Not necessarily guilt, though there was still a tinge of that but remorse for being a cause of someone's death, regardless of the circumstances. There's a history to Logan that Thea is learning, and I liked seeing that depth to him. He wasn't just the almost sidekicky kind of character anymore. He was somebody who has his own mission in life, was the Captain America character. I liked that... She supported him in being heroic by the end, but also he made sure to prioritize her as often as possible. That was one of the things that I wanted to do because overall in the first book, I kind of felt like I accidentally made Logan too perfect. And there was still a little bit of that in the second book. And I'm like, I need... I need to change this. He needs to have more depth to his character. He needs to have more flaws. Because it's just not realistic otherwise. Working in law enforcement, I know what that can do to relationships. I know how hard that can be. Because you are dealing with the worst of people all the time, it's hard to bring that home. It's hard to have personal relationships with people when you just deal with the worst of humankind all day. And you don't want to deal with anybody when you're done. I tried to bring that in. So he's trying to set aside his work, but he's also focused so much of his life on his work. He can't separate those two things. And I think Ori and Vanessa end up being a good example of what Thea and Logan aspire to be eventually. There's a good balance there. Even if Ori has seen some terrible stuff, Vanessa knows when to be a support and when to cover for him, when to help heal him if that's her role. And he knows when to be a husband and a father and not just a cop. And I think seeing both Logan and Thea learn those lessons was a great character arc for both of them. But I especially like Logan's. 
Thank you. That was not planned. <laughs> None of that was planned, but it worked. Panting. Yay. So, you know, and all of you listeners know, I am a huge fan of magic. I'm a huge fan of magic systems. That's what I really look for in a fantasy. And I just have to share this description that she made. This is only part of the scene, but it's so beautifully written and visual that I just, it's the first real chance to see what Ilana is capable of in her magic. She drew flames from the bonfire in the same way one might draw grain from a sack, clawing and grasping at it, letting it flicker up through her fingers before she overturned her hands. Much of the light dripped away to the ground at the movement, looking more like water than flame as it dissolved just before it hit the beaten earth. The rest of the fire, still hovering about an inch above her palm, suddenly flared up before winding horizontally around her swaying arms. And it's just so visual, so pretty. I can picture all of that, how she's moving, how graceful she is, and just reaching for this fire and bringing it to her. And it becomes almost part of her, not separate from her. And it's so well done. Congratulations. Thank you. One of the things I wanted to do fairly early on, and especially in this first book, is to align Alana with the sun and align Avel with the moon. That's most obvious in the final fight, but part of aligning with the sun and with warmth in a story that's very cold, it's a winter campaign, her being more than just the da -da -da hero French horns, she's a comfort and having her aligned with fire was important. In this case, she's a teenage girl. She's dancing. And that's all that's going on here. She just wants to get out. And in a lot of ways, MC is the only one who recognizes that she's a kid. And this is an expression of that. So even though it was just a dance, it was still so beautiful, very well written, showing us her and especially after what she'd gone through the night before it showed me that she's still strong and still holds to the knowledge of herself and then releases that in expressing herself this next line from yours i giggled so hard when i read it it's one of those relatable moments because i feel like we've all been there at one point and it's like that frustration of just being a human being is nicely summed up in this line. A rare spring 92 million mile headshot from the sun woke me in the late morning. We all know exactly what happened there and we have been there. That's a very relatable moment. It's hard to portray characters as frustrated without making them look weak or insufficient somehow. But when we can align ourselves with her frustration because we've been there, this is a nice example of that and just a great alignment of the reader if we drifted by that point, bringing us back to holding hands with Thea again. I don't remember where I heard that phrase first, 92 million mile headshot, but it's been several years. I used it a while when I was like early college, I think. And then I just haven't used it. But when this moment came across, I remembered that. And I was like, this is too perfect. <laughs> Beautiful use of that tool. Absolutely. Speaking of moments that make you just laugh out loud, this scene should not have made me laugh, but it, it did. I laughed while I was writing it, to be clear. <laughs> I've said before, her book is grim dark. There's a lot of really dark themes in there. And this particular scene is one character trying to force herself on another character because jealousy issues and whatever, stupidness. <laughs> Not book-wise, just her as a character. I hate her so much and I want to strangle her. Yay, that's the goal. She's the villain. So the MC just has this perfect sequence of reaction. And it ends with, I confess, I was out of ideas as to any way to fend her off. But fortunately, my body wasn't. 
My churning stomach came to my defense, sending sweet potatoes and deer jerky to my rescue. A little of the semi-processed meal bounced off her hand, but the rest made its way through her fingers and onto her face before landing on the warm animal skins between us. (laughs) So not only is it really well written, but it's just this wonderfully hilarious moment in what should be super dark that just it's that ease of tension we always talk about with the Joss Whedon quote make it dark make it grim but tell a joke and this was that moment it was so perfect because of the power dynamic between the two of them I had a really hard time figuring out how to get him out of this and it needed to be a way to quell her appetites without sating them if that makes sense So he tries a couple of other, I'm old enough to be your grandfather kind of things. And when that doesn't work, then this happens. And it's like, okay, well, if nothing else was a turnoff, this should be. (laughs) And this buys him time to just bolt. Speaking of dark, one of my favorite things about this story is the voice of the villain. There are several emails she gets throughout the story where this psycho guy is trying to both uplift her and put her through these trials to prove that she's a good person and blah, blah, blah. And you have a very good grasp of the criminally insane, I think. Um, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of why you chose this particular genre is your true crime podcast you listen to a lot of. That is true. True crime and my work. I deal a lot with the criminal mind. And it comes across in a fantastic way in these letters. There are a handful of psychotic things he says, putting her in the spotlight and this and that kind of thing. But I think my favorite is when he calls her a goddess. He says that she's immortal. And that really shows how far off the bandwagon he's gone. Because he starts putting her in life-threatening situations in a way that he doesn't see as life-threatening. Because that's a lot of the issue with a lot of these stories of psycho fan becoming dangerous. There is a gap in logic there of I'm going to hurt someone because I like them. This I'm going to prove to the world that you're immortal is a good way to do that and to absolutely terrify the rest of us on Thea's behalf. (laughs) I really enjoyed writing these letters. There was one letter in particular that I wrote. After I finished, I texted a friend of mine and was like, I'm kind of worried about myself now. Like low key worried about the fact this just came out of my brain. But it was so fun to explore that kind of character and what that character would do do with that obsession and focusing in on that and it's just those letters were such fun to write because they're a little bit older in writing style and that was not intentional I just started writing it and that's just what came out but it worked it definitely worked it was one of my favorite characters I think was the villain as shifter not necessarily as Isaac Isaac, he was fairly uninteresting, but as shifters, like the psychosis in that mind was just gorgeous. So I am going to share another one of my favorite moments. This is a moment that I talked about a little bit in a prior episode that just made me go, it made me queasy, but that was such the perfect reaction for this moment, for what happened. For reference... The main character, the first person I, has had this rope threaded between the two bones in his lower arm for about a week and a half now. It's festered, it's swollen, it's closed up and started to heal around this. It's gotten infected. It's gross. And this is the moment that, as a slave, his owner decides to start trusting him and it's made physical in a very painful way. Rocked started to pull. The braided twine stuck in place at first so that I needed to brace my arm as Rocked started the work. I had swallowed my whimpering as it slid through. 
More than once, I couldn't stop the sounds escaping from me as the rope scraped its way through the inside of my arm, pulling away from the flesh that had fused with it. Ugh. I feel that, and it hurts so much. Yay! Ah! But that's what is so good about this, is that it's so visual, so visceral. It shows, yes, this person who was supposed to be his enemy now trusts him enough to remove this disability, to remove this problem that's just becoming worse. And yes, it hurts, but it's such a final release. And the line right after that is something to the order of the pain was unbearable, but it was a relieving kind of pain. This next one is, I felt very endearing and very indicative of Logan and Thea's relationship. There is a huge will they, won't they, especially right in the middle, two thirds of the way through the story. And I believe they're on the phone at this point. Thea is thinking, uh, they're in person, but okay. his head is like behind her, okay. so she can't see him. So at this point, they are physically close, but she can't see him. But she understands what's going on in his mind and what he's doing because she's seen him do it enough. And this kind of phrase is proof that their relationship is a good one, that they're both paying attention to each other. The line goes, Logan tensed, and I could guess he'd drawn his lips into a tight line as he thought about how to phrase his concern. She knows what he's doing by a lack of sound, and I think that's a great indicator for the pair of them. Thank you. This is one of those rare moments of scene setting in your book that was so beautiful. To set it up, the main character's been tied between two trees in middle of the night as it's basically starting to be winter and just left to sit there. One of the ropes is the one that's through his arm and the other is just tied to his wrist. Even the ice coating the ropes began to melt, doing little more than swelling the fibers and tightening the knots. I wanted desperately just to be warm again, but I couldn't even remember the feeling. I watched as the morning frost made the fallen leaves crunchy, as if coated in sugar. Eventually, the sun fell on them, and they went soft once more. My body hurt with the combination of cold and the biting dryness of the morning air. Breathing through my nose would sting my throat, yet using my mouth would remind me just how thirsty I was becoming. So not only are we seeing the world around him, but we are also experiencing what he's going through in the moment. It's this beautiful combination of how cold he is represented not only in what you're showing him doing, but the world around him is doing. Yeah, this was one of those moments I almost cut. So I'm glad you pointed this out because it's like four paragraphs of nothing happened. I waited. It felt a little long for your style, but I still really enjoyed it because it did give us this view of the world connected with what the character was experiencing. They weren't separated, which is one problem a lot of people have with scene setting. They describe the scene without connecting it to the character experience. And these two were blended so well together. This next one I really like because it put all the cards on the table. There was a resignation almost in this moment that I really liked. And I ended up liking it so much that I made more comments saying more of this. I like this, but put more of this in there as I was editing. This line tells exactly her state of mind that makes especially novels special because you don't get this kind of point of view in theater or in film. Then again, how much did I really know him? He had a whole past I didn't know about. So why would it be a stretch to believe he'd conceal a more nefarious part of his nature? Those creeping doubts... As you're starting to turn characters against each other, questions are a great way to do that because we as audience are then compelled to answer the questions and we know how she's answering them and that helps us slide down that slope with her. 
and know his point of view because we can argue with the conclusions she's coming to, but you have to, as the author, ask the questions. This is a beautiful example of how that should be used in your storytelling. Thank you. I did follow your advice and try to include more of that throughout the story so that I wasn't just implying. I was a little more straightforward about what she was actually feeling, what she was actually doubting in their relationship. One of the other things that I wanted to point out, it's not a specific moment, but your villains. You talked to me about my villain. Now I get to talk to you about your villains. I hate them so much. Absolutely. I want to murder them both. She was such a good representation of a character who is chaotic and doesn't know what they want. So, so much of what she does is just, that's how I feel in the moment. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do this because that's what I want to do right now. And I'm going to do this because that's what I want to do right now. And it's coming from this character who has never known powerlessness. She can do what she wants because no one can say no to her. And it's beautiful. And then her brother is just like, well, I can do whatever I want because I'm skating on her skirt tails. And no one can say no to me either because if they do, I'll just have her kill them if I don't kill them myself. He has a lot of permissions in the culture that nobody else does. So a lot of his motivation is not necessarily in having or gaining power, but in expressing that power, in bending the rules that society has put in place. It's like, no, we don't do that. Well, he does. One of the moments that I remember with him was when they went out hunting and they split up into three groups. Two of the groups came back with sizable collections of animals that they trapped hunted, killed. And he came back with nothing. And he just declared, well, this area is spent. We need to move on anyway. And the MC makes this internal dialogue of, it's not spent. Look at what we got. And it's not up to you that we're leaving. We have to do that anyway for the winter. Like, who are you? And I loved it, that particular representation of Gorodok. And then MC's reaction to him was so representative of them. And I just, it was beautiful. I loved it. In the middle of that scene, he beats up everybody. <laughs> he just gives everyone a good healthy conk just to remind them who's in charge. And he even just whacks MC because he feels like whacking MC. It's like, well, you're the slave. You're not getting away scot-free on this. Uh, you're guilty too. Whack. I always hesitate in dropping political type things in the story and I feel like this moments I'm about to talk about could have been incredibly political it's like if Brie Larson was playing the character it would have been but I feel like it was more intimate than that and I really enjoyed that there is a moment where a member of the friend group pushes a kiss on the main character and she gets the chance to talk back at him. So this moment was a great, you tell him, girl, rah-rah. She's saying this to Jace. You're attractive, sure, but you're dumb. You can only blame alcohol and outside influence so much for your actions. Eventually, it stops being them and starts being you making those choices. If this isn't what we all want to say to everybody, it's like, start taking responsibility for your own actions. And I love that. And I was just like fist in the air, cheering her on. I wanted her to beat him up a little bit, but she's a better person than I am. But I did like this moment and I felt like this was another incredibly relatable moment where we were all on her side. You know, I had a couple of moments in this book where I could have gone really political with like the whole women's rights sort of thing. I tried to rein it back a little bit and I'm glad this moment came across like a intimate moment because that's what I wanted it to be. I didn't want it to be commentary about rape culture. I wanted it to be that's the reaction in the moment and that's the reasonable reaction every woman would have to these defenses of oh, well, I was drunk. Oh, well, we were enjoying it. Like, why did you suddenly say no? All these excuses that are made for unwanted advances. 
I'm really glad that you liked that because I loved writing that sentence. I was like, no matter what, this is staying in here. Absolutely. The final one that I have for you was near the end, another beautiful connection between characters and how they see each other, how they relate with each other. And it really showed the shift that the majority of the people had in how they viewed the villains and the heroes in the story. So to set up the scene, the main character is looking at Ilana, who is riding on horseback with the male villain who has done the most horrendous things to her over the course of the last week and a half. And he's noticing what she looks like. And it's that moment where you really feel that she's no longer T, that she is letting the trouble around her change her. It was a crime, even one committed by me, just to have allowed it to happen. But to have been the one to break such a stunning spirit, to replace a smile with that look on her face, was an act worthy of no punishment less than death. Still, I could do nothing apart from march on unable to even speak with her as we traveled. I wasn't the only one who noticed. Many of the men, including my own captor, looked in her direction and were changed. Mere sadness is not a strong enough word. Pity, perhaps, but it ran deeper than that. Heartbreak. So it's this beautiful showing of people recognizing, finally, that this girl was young And she's been tortured. And they all just let it happen. Yeah, that was definitely not just killing time because they're marching for like four days. If you really wanted to skip over, you could have just been, they started marching and they ended marching. But this moment made it worth talking about that to show that transformation of what she continued to go through, what she continued to endure And how suddenly being cut off from being able to interact with anyone else because of the circumstances started to break her down. I'm going to wrap up this patty cake we've been doing with a lot of short lines that are all from the same scene. The characters are at a D&D themed bar. Of all of the nerd culture out there, I feel like this has the fandom that spans generations. You have grandparents playing D&D with grandkids. A lot of your audience is going to relate to some aspect of this scene. So it was a great way to start off your story. For context, the bar is called Roll For It. I created it so that when you order a drink, you have to pass a check in order to get the drink you ordered. Which has all kinds of legal implications, but it's a lot of fun for a book. (laughs) One of the lines is, We accept. Cain gave a gracious bow from his seat that fit right in with the theme of the pub. Cain really gets a spotlight in this whole thing that I adore. He is such a fun character. As a Game of Thrones fan, I'm a little afraid to become like really attached to But I really like that particular character. And I feel like this whole interaction is his little moment in the sun, so to speak. He gets a little bit later on when he starts organizing the troops on her behalf. But he has that moment of just this grandiose bow because we're in a place where this is where you grandiose bow. Another line is said to him, and that's, it's called vicious mockery, fitting for you. Because he has that quick tongue, it's just a great D&D reference and character connection in one. I meant that more as like, you deserve to be viciously mocked, but it works both ways. (laughs) Yes. That came after he had Thea go order his drink and roll for him and came back with what was not what he ordered. This next line is them talking about the gaming world. And I felt was a good setup in that scene for everything that was about to come. They're talking about the roles 
in the game that Thea plays. Sometimes she's a tank, sometimes she's a healer, and sometimes she's support, flex, she's all of these different kinds of characters. The line is, I was best at support of all of us, though, so I got voluntold to play there. We all giggle at the voluntold, because we've all been voluntold at some point. But it's also a great, almost foreshadowing. We don't see it as foreshadowing at the time, but it's a great setup for the story arc that comes on later on. It is, isn't it? (laughs) I love moments like this as a pantser because it totally didn't plan that, but it works so well as that foreshadow. I just thought it was a funny line to throw in. And then it applies as foreshadowing. So yay, pantsing. Guys. (laughs) So all of that to say, I really hope you don't kill Cain. Please don't kill Cain. I like him. I like him too. And I don't plan on killing him. But I probably shouldn't have put the idea in your head. Well, it just all kind of depends on how the next book goes. Because again, I pants. If it calls for it, he's going to die. And don't hate me for saying this, but he's a better team leader than Thea is. In her defense, (laughs) every time we see her, she's going through the worst of things. So trying to lead while she's at that is just not very good. So usually she's a very good team leader. But when she's going through crisis, it just doesn't work out for her. Well, it's a good thing she has Kane. Yes. Overall... I really liked your book. I'm not super into the dark fantasy, the grim dark fantasy. That's not really my cup of tea. I like to have... Levity in your serial killers. Yes. (laughs) I generally like to avoid a lot of the more adult themes because I deal with that too much already. I need to get away from that in my enjoyment and entertainment says the true crime lover. (laughs) But it was a really great story, really great characters, and a great example of your writing, even in a fantasy setting. I definitely enjoyed yours as well. I feel like you're really growing as an author. You already have a huge head start because you've been an editor for so long, but your storytelling instincts are phenomenal. And most of the edits I'm making are just little adding a bit of flavor here. I would probably phrase this like this. Those kind of moments where there's always somewhere to improve. So as your editor, I had to kind of point out these are the things to pay attention to. And these are definitely the things that are your strengths and keep doing these things. And I feel like you have a lot of strengths in your storytelling. I'm interested to see what other genres when you branch out. Because Cozy Mystery isn't my cup of tea either. But I definitely enjoyed this one. This whole series, as we've said a couple of times, is to help you, our listeners, become familiar with this process of editing. We've said these things before, generally, not about our book specifically, in past episodes about the editing process. But we wanted to give a quick review of what to do when you're editing, what to do when you're being edited. So to all of you authors from us as editors, just a few reminders. We wouldn't have agreed to the project if we didn't already like your book. We are not your enemy. We're enjoying the book. This is one of those that Lee, I feel I have to remind her this because... I have a habit of editing a lot. I said when I went into this that I was, yeah, I'll just basically be doing line edits, small things. And then as she posted on her Facebook, there were what, more than 2,000 edits on a fairly short story? Yep. (laughs) So it's a reminder that just because I'm editing a lot doesn't mean I don't like it. I just see those areas where things could be improved. And a lot of my changes were, I would phrase it like this, or let's tighten things up a little bit. No sky bound water. (laughs) I'm never going to live that down. Absolutely not. You won't. And in that same vein, it is as an editor, our job to critique, 
not necessarily to praise. If you want someone to just tell you it's great, get your grandma to read it. An editor will help you make it better. They will help elevate your story to new heights. That's their job. They will tell you your strengths, hopefully. We'll get to that in a second. But it's not their job to just tell you the good parts. The cake is both the bread part and the frosting. If you had just the frosting, it would not be a very good cake. It's also not as easy as you would think to point out those good things. Because there are little moments, little details. It's difficult when you're going through everything to, as an editor, say, hey, I really liked this two-word line. So understand that though editors should be trying to do that, they won't do it at every single moment that they liked. One of my favorite lines in a Jack Reacher novel, and possibly one of my favorite lines of all time, is get the potato peeler. That sounds so ominous, knowing that it's your favorite line. (laughs) It was an incredibly dark moment where the villain had been threatening to harm this woman's daughter in front of her. And he, a couple chapters prior, had given her this speech of all the terrible things he was going to do to the daughter, and it included a potato peeler. And the woman still aligned with Jack Reacher anyway, because he was the hope to get them out of the situation. Villain finds out, that's the line. Obviously, don't put that line in your own writing. It's that whole structure of setting up this entire scene where he's threatening to do terrible things with a potato peeler so that it pays off in that line. That's really hard to point out and just highlight the whole thing and go, this was the good part. But those are some of the best moments in storytelling. It's just hard as an editor to say this is a good moment. Also, don't get discouraged when you see a lot of edits. Edits mean we're engaged. We're paying attention. There's this beautiful middle there. Because if there are no edits, it's quite possible the editor just, they're not engaged They're skimming past it because they just don't feel the story. And then edits will increase as they, liking the story, they're engaged in it. And then they'll drop off again when the editor is just so engaged in the story, they're paying attention to the story rather than editing. So it's this delicate balance, but you want your editor to be in the middle, honestly, because you want to have those good constructive criticisms as they're going through. And editors... You don't get off scot-free either. We do have some commentary we want to make sure you understand as you are engaging in these pursuits. As we were just talking to the authors, you absolutely, as an editor, need to point out what you liked. Shoot us a text, send us an email, however it is you communicate. Let us know as you read it even if you can't make a mark, just like I did when I was reading that line about pulling the thread out of the dude's arm. I sent her a text and was like, oh, that's so gross. I'm so queasy. It's amazing. I love it. Those not only help us as authors feel good about the moment and our own writing and the relationship between editor and author, but it also helps prepare us to as we read through that scene and all of the edits you make in it, it helps us to digest those a little bit better. And along the same lines, as an author, I like seeing reactions of any kind. Not necessarily just a, oh, I liked this scene, but an LOL on this line, or I hate this character now. These kinds of reactions help us as authors understand what's going through the audience's mind. And that is a lot of your job as an editor to act on behalf of the audience. And when you put these comments in of, this is what's going through my mind, this is when I set it down. This is when I got bored. Those kinds of things help us as authors refine our craft. Especially since I write whodunits, I like to have my editors, my beta readers, make a comment throughout the story of who they think at that point is the villain. 
Is there anything that is being said, being done, that makes the reader think that it's someone else or that it is my villain? So Lee had pointed out one comment of this reaction from the sister-in-law suddenly makes her a suspect in my mind. And that was not at all what I intended. So I was like, okay, I have to change that because that was a good reaction that I needed to know in order to make my writing better. So it's not always a good reaction. It's not always a bad reaction. Sometimes it's just, this is how I reacted to this moment. And if that's how we want our readers to react, great, perfect. That's the kind of feedback we need. It's also really good to let your author know when you're done. Send him an email, send him a text, point out a couple of the general things that you liked about the whole thing so that when they open up that document, they see all of those edits, they don't get discouraged because they understand, yes, you still liked enough. Having those positive comments be the first thing I see as I'm opening the document helps me be in the right frame of mind to value your edits as an editor and not to want to argue against you. Because I've found in working with other editors before, I still end up sending you screenshots going, what do you think of this particular moment? Because I don't value that editor's opinion like I do yours. And just a quick note, because I hear this as a mistake that a lot of new editors make, is, oh, this is a lot like this other story. You wrote a story that's a lot like Percy Jackson. Please don't do that. I, as an author, feel like my story is unique and interesting. And yes, if Lee Child had written part of Daenerys' story in Game of Thrones, it might come out something like this. But it's my story. Leave those comparisons for the marketing team. This has been such a fun adventure for me. I hope it's been for you as well, Lee. Absolutely. Being able to write, being able to have such a trusted editor go through my stuff, let me know what they're thinking, let me know what they're feeling so I can make the best possible book that I can right now. Because I know I'll get better. I'll have better books. This is my start in the author career. But being able to discuss like this, talk about those specific details, talk about that having this open communication to both editors and authors, that's what you need to have. A good open communication so you can work to better each other. If you find this podcast on our website or perhaps through Facebook, perhaps through Spotify, our descriptor is an author and her editor. And two years ago, almost now, when we started the podcast, I was the author, you were the editor. And now we're both both for each other. And I feel like we've both become better at our initial titles because we've worn each other's hats in a way. And I feel like even now, after we've just published a bunch of stuff, as we're starting and engaging in new projects, we know that the best way to go through and grow is to write selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 